Hey everybody, this is Martin Glaberman's 1968 preface to the third edition of State Capitalism and World Revolution, written in collaboration with Raya Dunayevskaya and Grace Lee Boggs. <coughs> um, yeah. When the second edition of State Capitalism and World Revolution was at the printer, the Hungarian Revolution exploded. It could only be acknowledged in a few paragraphs on the cover. Now while this third edition is being prepared, the totality of what was put forward in this document is revealed in the revolutionary struggles of French workers and students. These struggles are not over as this is being written. In the years since the second edition of State Capitalism and World Revolution was published in England, much of what was contained in this document has been accepted by a wider public. What was first said here in 1950 became visible in many after the thaw, to many after the thaw in the Cold War, and the increase in travel and communication between the nations of the West and of the East. The characteristics which the Soviet Union shared with all capitalist countries could be seen directly. It no longer had to be called from statistical analyses or from reading between the lines of speeches to the Congresses of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, excuse me, Congresses of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Yet this work is not only out, not out of date, it is more valuable than ever, for its significance has only incidentally been its accurate description of Russia. It's only incidentally been its accurate description of Russia and Western European society. The importance of this book is that it refined and brought up to date the theory of Marxism and made it expl directly applicable to our own time. What is most often overlooked by those who accept entirely or in part the conception of the, that the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union's related states are fundamentally capitalist is that this analysis is an analysis of capitalist society, not Russian society. The conclusions flowing from this analysis have the greatest relevance in the understanding of the United States as well as the Soviet Union, Great Britain as well as Poland, France as well as China, and, of course, the working class of all these countries. Capitalism is an international society, and the working class is a class that transcends national borders. Marx's description of 19th century England did not describe 19th century France or Germany, but the conclusions which Marx drew from his study of Great Britain were applicable everywhere. In chapter 5, the class struggle, quote, the mode of labor in the United States, end quote, is set down side by side with, quote, the mode of labor in Russia, end quote. The specific form of class relations in Russia led to Vorkuta, to the German revolt, uh, to the Polish and Hungarian revolutions, and to the workers' councils as the new form of workers' struggles. But that form is as international as the Commune was in 1871, as Soviets were in 1905 and 1917, not in detail but in essence. Otherwise, all theory is nonsense, or theory becomes a universal theory of national exceptionalism. For the last 12 years, the Hungarian Revolution has been evidence of the concrete stage of the struggle for socialism. It, has established, it had established in life what could only be established in the abstractness of theory before, the Hungarian Revolution began with the total destruction of the vanguard party as any kind of revolutionary instrument. The Hungarian Revolution indicated how far in advance of 1917 the world of the 1950s was. An educated modern working class did not require indirect methods of representation. In the workers' councils, it created the instruments of direct democracy, what has been called in the United States participatory democracy. This, of course, has nothing in common with the, quote, participation, end quote, of de Gaulle or the workers' councils of Tito, both of which are designed so that workers can participate in their own exploitation. The Hungarian working class did not require separate instruments to control other sections of society. Farmers, office workers, technicians, civil servants, all created their own equivalent of workers' councils to manage their own affairs in the name of the revolution as a whole. 
Instead of workers or students taking over such strategic instruments as radio stations and newspapers, the staffs of these institutions made their own revolution. Only in the totality of the Hungarian Revolution does much of what has been happening in the United States in the years since 1956 become clear. The refusal of the black liberation movement to confine itself to the limits of a single traditional organization, the constant search for and experimentation with new social and organizational forms on the part of black militants, students and middle-class anti-war fighters, the resistance of American workers to union-imposed contracts and procedures, all reflections of the new stage that emerged in Hungary in 1956. Now, in 1968, the struggle is renewed in France. In 1950, the following was noted in State Capitalism and World Revolution, quote, the Stalinist leaders aimed to control the mass proletarian mobilization in exactly the same manner as de Gaulle aims to control those of the petty bourgeoisie. The Leninist party in 1950, in practice where it can, but in theory always, must be the expression of the mass proletarian mobilization aimed against the bureaucracy as such. The, this bureaucracy in Russia, in France and Italy, even where it is in, in, where it is in opposition, and in the United States is the embodiment of the plan of state capitalism, end quote. The revolution in France has already carried the theory of 1950 and events of 1956 further. It is necessary to say now that Communist Party, Social Democratic Party, trade unions, all are bourgeois institutions. They can neither speak nor for nor negotiate for the revolution. The revolution is not the means by which workers achieve new socialist institutions to replace the old bourgeois institutions. The revolution is the means by which the socialist institutions emerge and destroy the bourgeois institutions which restrain the socialist institutions. The mode of labor in the United States, that is, the specific form of relations between the working class and the working class as oppressors, also reflects this new stage and must lead to an American equivalent of workers' councils. Quote, The bureaucracy inevitably must substitute the struggle over consumption, higher wages, pensions, education, etc., for a struggle in pr production. That this is the basis of the welfare state, the attempt to appease the workers with the fruits of labor when workers seek satisfaction in the work itself. The bureaucracy must raise a new social program in the realm of consumption because it cannot attack capitalism at the point of production without destroying capitalism itself, end quote. Since that was written, it has been demonstrated in many ways. Negatively, the bureaucracy, especially of the former CIO unions, have demonstrated that they are no longer the simple, corrupt agents of capitalists as their old line AFL antecedents. John L. Lewis of the Miners, Walter Reuther of the Auto Workers, Harry Bridges of the Longshoremen, and their brothers in other industrial unions have long demonstrated their willingness to participate directly in the management of production and the disciplining of rank and file workers through union, the union contract and the grievance procedure. No matter how modified the form, this is no longer the traditional behavior of the labor fakers of the epoch of imperialism. This is the Stalinism, or perhaps Neo-Stalinism, of the labor bureaucracy in the epoch of state capitalism. It should be clear that the term Stalinism is not being used in the narrow sense of a faction of the Communist Party. The same distinction is needed to understand the difference between Attlee and Wilson, who were and determined that the Labor Party shall administer British capitalism, and MacDonald and his brethren of pre-World War II who were equally determined that it should not. These are the bureaucrats in the United States and Great Britain and elsewhere whom the Marxist sectarians are determined to educate to their, quote, responsibilities, end quote, or replace with more efficient bureaucrats. The workers, of course, have other ideas. The massive 1955 Wildcats and the United Auto Workers, for the first time openly counterposed the struggle in production, end quote, to, quote, the struggle over consumption, end quote. To Reuther's new national agreement, which included the precedent-setting supplemental unemployment benefits, the workers replied with, quote, specific local grievances, end quote, 
which in their tens of thousands ran gamut, the gamut of life in the factory and indicated the determination of the workers to control production. Since then, the process expanded and intensified, leaving very few industries untouched. In this struggle, Marxist methodology requires that the Hungarian workers' councils act as a goal and a guide. When workers are clearly rejecting the concept of a return to the beginnings of the union, when they are searching for new forms of organization, it is not the function of conscious revolutionists to urge them to confine their struggle to the limits set by labor bureaucrats and the requirements of capitalist production. It is necessary to describe the struggle as it really is, the search by American workers for their equivalent of the workers' councils. The only alternative is to pretend that the trade unions can perform some kind of revolutionary function, something they have never been able to do, even under considerably more favorable circumstances. The conception that there is a revolutionary potential in the American trade union, has been, union movement has been rejected by American workers, but this serves still to mislead numbers of radicals looking for ways in which to fight the American imperialist colossus by helping to conceal the fundamental division between workers and union officials and the deadly war that goes on constantly between them. It is only ignorance of this war which can lead to theories that proclaim the incorporation of the workers into the capital E establishment or the disappearance of the working class altogether. In a peculiar view which believes that workers who have won themselves through decades of bitterest and most violent class struggle increased incomes, private homes and cars, refrigerators and television sets are therefore more likely to enter the factory each morning of their lives and accept without serious argument inhuman totalitarian treatment that is a combination of the penitentiary and the kindergarten. Quite the contrary. Only the struggles, the explosions, the new forms of organization are inevitable. The origin of state capitalism and world revolution as a document was that was presented to the Trotskyist movement required that it have polemical elements throughout it was the positive presentation of a profoundly new analysis. This has resulted in its containing names that would be unfamiliar to the ordinary reader. Pablo, it's Michel Pablo, and Ernest Germain, I believe that's the first name he used, but those are, uh, Pablo is uh, Michel Raptis, and say the head of uh, Fourth International and the, uh, I believe it's International Secretariat, and uh, Germain was kind of like a leading, uh, was Marnus Mandel, and was like the leading theoretician of that section. Pablo and Germain were the political pseudonyms of European Trotskyists who had differing views on the problems under discussion. Faced with the collapse of Marx's theory, Pablo, excuse me, faced with the collapse of Trotsky's theory, Pablo represented a new orthodoxy which sacrificed Marx's methodology in order to extend Trotsky's defense of the Soviet Union to a principle applicable to all Stalinist societies. Germain, not willing to go that far, introduced an empirical form of exceptionalism to permit him to decide for himself which Stalinist societies were worker states and which were not. Shankman was at the time the head of the Workers' Party, a split off from the Trotskyist Socialist Workers' Party. The Workers' Party, after a series of metamorphoses, was dissolved into the Socialist, Worker Socialist Party, of which Shackman is part of its extreme right wing. Um, no mention here of the Independent Socialist League um, that emerged out of the Workers' Party, which would have people such as uh, Julius um, and I believe Phyllis Jacobson and uh, Hal Draper, and all the people that would constitute like the background, background of the backbone of the uh, journal uh, New Politics. Um, Um, yeah, <clears throat> leaving them out uh, makes it seem as though uh, uh, James and his comrades uh, were the only people um, to have a uh, fundamental crit critique of the Soviet Union uh, coming from the Trotskyists, emerging from the Trotskyists movement and no longer remaining.
The origin of this work as the collective viewpoint of the Johnson Forest tendency also dictated that its authorship be anonymous. It's gratifying to be able to record that with the kinds of assistance from other members of this grouping that are usual for political documents, the author was C.L.R. James. Perhaps this will help to place James, who wrote for a number of years under the pseudonym J.R. Johnson, in a truer light as a major inheritor and continuator of the Marxist tradition. E.N. Martin Glaberman. 1968.